Hello, and welcome to the task block at GDQ Express 2018. I have with me Cheese05. We have a jam-packed block of amazing tasks to show you. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to just start this run and throw him under the bus because he has exactly, <laughs> what, four minutes and... Four minutes and 21 seconds. To say how many words? I'd like, a lot. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> this is going to move fast. Here goes. All right. Three, two, one, go. All right, I'm going to start off right away with like four main definitions that we kind of have to go through uh, so you guys could know what I'm talking about. Uh, first one is uh, parallel, parallel universes, or PUs for short. It sounds kind of complicated, but basically it's just like a region of space located far outside the intended map, wherever, whatever map it may be. Um, uh, and the intended map boundaries that reflect certain aspects, like floors and ceilings, for example. So basically, it's like a simple copy of the main map, like really far out that we can't really see. And we use that a lot in this task to be able to like warp into the, in other places really fast, and especially the motor, it's really important for that. So um, overflow jump, basically, uh, there are two types of PUs, vertical and horizontal. So an overflow jump, basically, when Mario gets sent into a vertical PU, uh, the game checks with his position, and he basically gets snapped back up. And that snapback is uh, is an overflow jump that gets him back to the main map. Um, so basically, what's going to happen right now? It's a simple BLJ to get into the vanish cap area, and he utilizes something called a negative jump right here to just jump down into the vanish cap area. So right now he's going to do a BLJ on the rising platforms down here, and this is important. So this is the first parallel universe moment. So we change the camera to so the camera doesn't follow Mario, or else we'll actually like crash the game here. Okay, so what happened right there? Um, he went. He got sent into a horizontal parallel universe inside a vanish cap from the speed, and the platform basically voided him out. And then after that, because he spawned in water outside of Vanish Cap, his speed was conserved from, from the Vanish Cap area. And on the first frame that he touched the waterfall, we press Z to trigger like uh, the stored speed from before. And that allows him to actually enter another PU in the castle grounds. And then in PUs, it's important to note that water doesn't exist. So he's able to just clip into the moat um, because there's no water and then walk into the, the moat door. Um, right now, basically another instance of a BLJ into a PU. Right. So yeah. um, basically, instead of entering a horizontal PU, he enters a vertical PU. And it just so happens that his position in that, in that uh, parallel universe, um, relative to the main map, is it happens to be on the same position um, as the top platform where the bomb arm is. Yeah. Um, on the main map. So an overflow jump occurs and sends him back up to the main map on that set position, which is on top of that platform. And it just so happens that platform is perfectly in line with the Bowser loading trigger. OK, dab? Yeah, the dab. All right, everybody dab. dab to the right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, that is, uh, in, in the Japanese version only, you can actually dab after grabbing a key. It's like, it's a little meme. Why not? Um, so that's what happens. and. Um, you you get sent into Bowser 2 from the from the position that you get from the overflow jump, and we need to use one key here. This is the yeah. only key in the entire run. We That's don't even uh, get any stars. Right. So right now he's going to perform a side BLJ, which is the sideways. Basically, it's the same thing. Um, so this is important. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> quick lesson. Uh, quick explanation. So on the 50 star door, when the text triggers, uh, what that does, it gets to turn Mario around to face forward. And as soon as the text is finished, we press Z to trigger to restore the, uh, the speed that we had stored before. And the frame after that, we press C up, which cancels the sliding animation. And the frame after that, we press B to punch, and that cancels the C up animation. And that allows us to get against the TTC uh, wall. And in that wall, we do like uh, the, the frame perfect, uh, sorry, the first frame wall kicks. And it has to be first frame wall kicks. It's important because if it's not a first frame wall kick, you lose all of your speed. So we utilize that and just skip the door and everything and get up to Bowser 3. And now we're in Bowser 3 in four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and now the game's done. <laughs> That's. Uh, Where's time? And uh, almost. Yeah. On the, when you grab the star, it's the time. As soon as you grab the big star. Time. Beautiful. So uh, I try to get 
as much of, a, of an explanation that I, I could in those four minutes, but um, huge shout out to Tyler Keen. He was the one who ex found the exploit to actually get in the motor to, to actually make one key task possible. So huge shout outs to him. And of course, MK Dasher, Sonic Packer, Plush, all these guys. And a special shout outs to Bad Boot, Josh Demon, Johnny Young, and Tyler Keen again. Um, those guys were helping me for the past week on calls, trying to explain everything to me. A week ago, I didn't know any of this. It's, <laughs> it's extremely different to RTA speedrunning. So huge shout outs to them. Um, I've been, my eyes are open to the task community now, and it's amazing. So. I'm so looking forward to it. It's awesome. And as you might have known, we did do this technically-ish inside of AGDQ 2017, but we didn't have any of the commentary that Cheese was able to provide. Thanks, Cheese 5 right. I really appreciate it. If you want more information, you go to taskvideos.org and have a look. We're going to move over to the next segment, so quick break. Thanks. OK, welcome back. So we've quickly transitioned from a console game to a PC game. This is Hyper Princess Pitch. Uh, yeah, I kind of figured. So, as always, we're, when we do things on PC with Hourglass, it can be a little bit finicky. We knew this coming in, so give us just a moment while we get that set up. But we're going to keep going because uh, we're going to try to go live. So do you think it's going to work this time? Yeah, it should work this time. should work this time. Okay. It always works the second time. Always works the second time. That's, <laughs> yeah, no, that was, that's always the way it was. Okay, so this is Hyper Princess Pitch. I have Ty Kevin 83 here, plus we've got Stump. I didn't do introductions. Uh, we've got uh, Scent, and we've got Glitch Cat 7 on the couch. I don't know who's on the back couch. I can't see them all. <laughs> all right, are we live? Are we going? This seems like it's working now. OK, so we should probably start the timer. Sick. Yes, OK. OK, what the heck is going on here? Uh, we have a brick shot. That's the first most important thing to know about Hyper Princess Pitch. You might not be able to see it very much, but we have a, a brick that we can shoot at things with our cannon. This is about as bullet hell as you can possibly. Yeah, I'm just imagine. gonna I'm gonna let you guys watch this for a second and kind of absorb the insanity. That was a pile driver, right? Yes. So that move there, where you pick something up, it's called the pile driver. You press up, down, left, right. It actually teaches you how to do it after you beat the game for the first time. And uh, if you would do that, then it'll pick something up and kill it instantly. There's there's no chance that it won't kill it unless it's a boss. Bosses can't be pile driven, of course. Um, and it will also kill anything it lands on. It's very useful in task. There's one problem with the pile driver. The pile driver leaves you uh, vulnerable for one frame out of like a 90 frame reset window. So you can keep doing it over and over again, but you have to make sure you land in a place where you're going to be safe so you can repeatedly do the pile driver. And she's literally throwing bricks, isn't she? Yes. And that's the ice move. There, there's three different kind of moves you can use. There's a brick move, an ice uh, a shot, and a, a rainbow shot. We're going to save all of our rainbow shots for the final boss because they're the most useful. OK, what the heck? <laughs> oh, I should also explain the premise of this game since we didn't get to see the opening cutscene. So we are uh, Hyper Princess Pitch, a character from Daniel Ramar's series of video games. and. Uh, the good Mecha Santa never gave us presents when we were kids. So we're on a mission to go kill Santa so nobody else can get presents either. OK. <laughs> yeah, uh, Daniel Ramar does all sorts of these game maker games. He started uh, doing them a long time ago. Oh, this oh, one moment, one moment. Oh, Chris a boss. Slay. <laughs> Had to be said. <laughs> yeah, the Slay of Death, I think I was saying. Um, so he was starting out doing these games back in like 2011. And uh, he based a lot of these games on uh, events from his friends' lives. So the difficulty level you were probably seeing on screen, really Joel's mom difficulty. Well, really Joel was one of his friends, and he would always say that his dad was better than him at any game he could possibly find. So the, in most of Daniel Ramar's games, the hardest difficulty level is really Joel's dad. Well, who could be better at a video game? Really Joel's mom. So for this game, the hardest difficulty is even harder. It's really Joel's mom difficulty. That's difficult. There, yeah. There's a lot going on here that is hard to explain. It's even harder to see. And I'm kind of amazed the game does not melt with so many objects flying around the screen. Yeah, this is a, a two-core lap. I have no idea how this is working right now. <laughs> It, it is worth mentioning that really Joel's mom difficulty, as far as I know, wasn't intended to ever be beaten. It was just kind of like, yeah, sure, let's, let's put it in as a joke. Yeah, it, it's not supposed, even for a task, to, to, uh, intended to be beaten. This is nuts. 
the fact that it, he made the whole campaign stupidly difficult is what really blows my mind. Mm -hmm. How far did you make it when you played this, then? Um, so th this is a secret difficulty. You do have to do some extra stuff to unlock it. I tried it once. I think I made it, like, one room into the game before losing all of my lives and saying, nope, nev never again. That's a lot of pile drivers. <laughs> yeah, and we're switching to the ice shot. It has this ricochet effect you can see there. And also, a lot of times we will be moving towards the end of a floor as we're shooting so that we can leave immediately after we finished off the last enemy. Uh, really good strategy there from the Tasser, Serilith, who wrote this. It just keeps getting insane. As, uh, as Pitch is pile driving, I, I do want to point out um, the precision movement in this task is actually really cool. Because unlike more modern games, you don't really have too much in the way of like diagonal moving or moving while shooting. It's not a twin stick shooter game. Um, so I mean, a lot of the times you kind of see her like vibrate up and right or yeah. down and right. And that's just, you know, alternating up and right on every frame, I'd assume. Yeah, you can only move in uh, diagonal if you're not uh, shooting. You can change your facing if you're not shooting, but if you're shooting, you only can strafe. So the controls are really weird to do for a human, but Tass, of course, can just pause shooting very slightly and repeatedly kill things. Um, did you remember uh, to plug in your laptop? Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Um, um, it's fine? Technical difficulties. Are you sure it's fine? I don't know what's going on. Oh, no. Your laptop went to sleep, didn't it? In yeah. It, yeah. It, 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 uh, <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Well, um, what are our options? What do we do? Um, we have two choices. We stop here and mercy kill the run, or we try again. Tech team, what do you say? Okay. They mercy killed it. Yeah. <laughs> Good news, everyone. Christmas isn't canceled. Santa survives the run. Yay! <laughs> If you would like to see the rest of this run, I encourage you, please head over to taskvideos.org. You'll find this in the Windows section of the Movies. You can just click on the Movies tab. You'll see all of the consoles we have to assist the speedruns for. Simply go to the Windows platform, or PC platform. You'll see this in the list. It is one of the most insane conclusions. You cannot believe how many bullets are on the screen at the end. Yes, that was clickbaity. We're going to take a pause, throw back over to the host station, and we'll be right back with some Pokemon Yellow. And start the timer. We're already going right now. All right. So, And we're also already manipulating things. Exactly. Right now. So we should just explain the layout of the screen. What's going on here with that thing on the left? Okay. So on the left, you're going to be seeing the input display using the Game Boy interface developed by Extremes to show the inputs that we are sending to the Game Boy player. In the center, you're seeing the uh, Pikachu from the intro sequence. And we are already setting up, uh, we set up the trainer ID, that unique ID that makes your Pokemon uniquely yours to be a bit of code that's going to later point to the uh, number of Pokemon that you have in your party. And we're also setting up the rival name with some code and uh, now you're going to see a pretty cool trick. Oh, by the way, the sound might change, so. Yes, the sound might change slightly. We set fast options. Fast options when you press left at the same time that you press A to go into the options menu. And that's, that's all your options, one to the left. Uh, that's really useful because you need to go from medium to fast text. You need to turn animations off. And you need to turn a battle style to set from shift so you don't have to change Pokemon in the middle of a battle. Um, so that was all really useful. It has a side effect of setting Earphone 3 as an option, which is really weird stereo setting that would very be very uh, different from what you're used to for yellow. So we're going to have them do the favor of us mi mixing it back to what you're used to. And we're going to be manipulating another thing here. So uh, uh, the first half of the data that we need to point to our party is for coming from the trainer ID, that unique ID I mentioned. And the second half is going to be coming from Pikachu's DVs. Those are terminator values that determine how powerful Pikachu is of a Pikachu. Because they can go from being a really weak Pikachu to being a really uh, strong Pikachu. We're going to use those numbers as code to point to our party index. We also are going to need to win this rival battle that's coming up here where we would usually uh, lose it in a task. Tasks usually like to lose the rival battle in... Um, 
Pokemon Yellow because you get a Vaporeon if you lose. Uh, and Vaporeon's team has a Ninetales that has Quick Attack, and Quick Attack's very useful for managing your HP, keeping yourself very low in Red Bar, where you skip a lot of jingles. But here, we're not going to be battling enough for Red Bar to be relevant. So we are going to win the fight instead and use the data value set from winning the fight, including Eevee's stat experience that it gives you. The, the EVs from Gen 1 is called stat experience. We're going to use that data to decrement our party count. So we go from having one Pokemon to zero Pokemon to 255 Pokemon in our party. All the Pokemon <laughs> right now. Uh, well, not yet. But. So all of that stuff, we are already setting up the data for that in the intro playing the game. And this is your run, right? Mm -hmm. I wrote this run in TAS, and I did it with the help of Lucky Typhlosion, Goddess Maria, and String Flow on the Manips uh, for the run, making sure the RNG came out the way we wanted it to. You also probably noticed that we held B while we walked through Pikachu. That makes sure you don't bonk on Pikachu when you walk through him. And walking through the grass here, we call this YOLO grass. So we're going to be walking through the grass and using A presses and also some diagonal turns to manipulate the amount of time that the console has been on very precisely, which will give us different RNG. Because it will, uh, if you press A, it will check to see if there's an NPC in front of you. And also, coincidentally, if there's an item in front of you, because items are coded as NPCs in this game. And now we have the parcel. We have to go through a lot of this entry stuff because we don't have a, a way of getting a glitch to happen in uh, the intro where we're getting the parcel and all that. We have to get to Viridian Forest for that. And you'll see more YOLO grass here. This is the full YOLO grass, we call it. Stump, would you try this? <laughs> no? I don't know. No? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we also learned that it's a few like uh, cycles faster to walk one left before going through the grass in Pokemon Gen 1. We don't really know why. <laughs> Somebody just tested it and figured it out. Oh, and we're walking behind Oak here before we talk to Oak. Each step that you take as the character takes 17 frames, and that is twice as long for the rival. So we're making the rival have a shorter amount of time on screen walking to Oak, because uh, he walks at half our speed. So every te extra step we take is step saved from the rival. you also notice a lot of these text boxes in these paragraphs, at the, the end of the paragraph boxes, we intentionally clear with the B button instead of the A button, even though you can use both buttons, because the B button clears those text boxes faster. Thanks, Gen 1. Yeah, we don't know why. There's so many weird quirks of this game. Yeah. And we're at the pedestrian part of this run. Yeah. Like It's been this, pretty this, normal so this far. This is a slow walk, but it, it's about to pick up significantly. We're going to go to Viridian Forest again, or not Forest, but Viridian City, buy a Pokeball, and that Pokeball is going to be used after we die in Viridian Forest to catch a Pidgey on the way back up from Pallet Town. So we are going to be going after getting the Pokeball to Viridian Forest to do something called a Death Fly, so, uh, or Trainer Fly. We're going to get a Pokemon encounter in front of a trainer as the trainer sees us. Us. But it's not the trainer's battle. No. The, tra the battle we're going to get is going to be the wild Pokemon encounter. And we're going to let ourselves die intentionally to the wild Pokemon encounter. And then after that death happens, the game executes the start of the trainer battle. But we're dying, so it sends us back to Pallet Town. So when we go back to Viridian Forest, a whole bunch of code will start executing related to that battle happening. And we're going to be manipulating what data is going to be set up in memory uh, for that code that gets executed. So what happens when we go to Viridian Forest will be a mart as opposed to a battle. And the walk here is that all this stuff is relevant for the manipulation of data values. We need to get a Pidgeotto at the end of the forest. So we're going to be taking a path very specifically through the forest to get us to the end where the Pidgeotto window will line up. There's this thing in Gen 1 called DSUM. It's a side effect of the way that the RNG works. And basically the encounters all end up happening on 13 second cycles. And there's 10 different encounter slots. So each one takes up uh, a different amount of time. Uh, they're different sizes of windows. The Pidgeotto is the smallest window of those 10 windows, okay? So it's a actually 1 one hundredth of the 13 second window. So we need to align it so that we get to the front of that trainer at the end and get the Pidgeotto encounter in that 0 0.13 second window. It's pretty tight. It's very tight. But 
tool assisted speed run. We can do whatever like. So we're going to be doing this. <laughs> so that we get our Pidgeotto encounter. Why not? And we need Pidgeotto specifically because we need to die to it in one hit. No, nothing else can kill this Pikachu in one hit like the Pidgeotto. It even, has, it even needs to have a high attack uh, DB. Oh, that sound. That is so painful. Ouch. And then you can see the trainer battle triggering, like I was saying, so that when we re-enter the forest, it will cause a bunch of glitch code to execute. Now, the next thing you're going to be seeing is us depositing Pikachu. That's the first step of what I was talking about with decrementing the party count. Oh, we also need to catch our extra Pokemon. We can't do this whole party stuff with Pikachu. We need to switch to using Pidgey for it. Ow, that's the Watch the nickname of Pidgey very closely. It's going to be very fast here coming up. Right about now. <laughs> so that's very important, actually. It is critically important that we nickname Pidgey Tass because that corresponds to a number of bits that is going to give us an owned Pokemon count of 62 later when we go to the Hall of Fame. Critically important. <laughs> Could it have been anything other than Tass? Don't spoil the fun, Dwago. I'm just checking. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it can be something else, but Tass uh, is coincidentally one of the names. Now, this is something called the Manip. We call it the Manip because it is one of the most complex and difficult Manips to execute as a human trying to do the no-save corruption category. We're going to be doing it with a soft reset instead of a hard reset, as you'd normally have to do, because we don't need to worry about hard resetting to clear out the RNG to a constant state. We have to flash the Pokedex as part of setting up the memory to get the... Uh, glitch mart when we go into Verdian Forest. We also need to start moving these uh, NPCs in the uh, room here. The girl needs to move up off screen, and the bird needs to keep moving left, okay? So we're going to pause slightly and have the bird move off screen to the left as we move off to the right. That sets up memory, again, part of getting the glitch mart. Oh, and that. We have to jump that ledge. Yes. That is critically important to getting the glitch mart. <laughs> How do you find all this stuff, anyway? <laughs> I don't. Lucky Typhlosion does. Lucky Typhlosion is the guy who knows all this. And we, are, we have our entry point. <laughs> and you will see, as we're scrolling down in the Glitch Mart, you will see uh, repeated left and right presses. That's something called double input. Uh, you need to do that. Oh, and now we are decrementing our party count, like I was saying, using values we set up earlier. We are moving that task nickname into the rival name. Then we are uh, setting our map index here to the Hall of Fame, so that this is all of our map data. Now we're moving the nickname from rival name, task name, into the owned Pokemon count. That's going to change last input to here, time. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and you'll see owned th that 62 in the owned Pokemon count was the task nickname we did. In fact, this is the no save corruption because we didn't actually corrupt the save file itself in any point. If you go back to AGDQ 2015, I believe, is when we did Pokemon Plays Twitch. We had Pokemon Red and we did corrupt the save file yep. there. They used saved corruption there, but it's actually much more technically interesting, in my opinion, the ways you need to glitch the game in order to beat it quickly without using save corruption. Exactly. Well, thank you very much for watching. This next up is GlitchCat7 helping us play some amazing Super Mario World versions, uh, variants, whatever you want to call them. A little hesitant to call them a certain name, but you're going to see that in just a second. We're going to take a brief break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back. This is Taskbot right here. You've seen him a little bit. He's right up here on this hand cam. You can see uh, there's a visualization board here. As he plays, you'll see lights come on. Uh, I have with me GlitchCat7. You might know him from places. Now, this is not just a normal Super Mario world. You're going to understand in just a second. All right, brace yourselves. We're going to get started. In three, two, one, go. All right. Well, uh, just like Dwango said, this is Kaizo Super Mario World 3. This is the third and presumably final in a series of games that was made by a really talented and mysterious maker named T. Takamoto. The text here explains that Peach has been 
kidnapped too many times and perhaps it is time to end the monarchy. Uh, you'll see that this game has a lot of different modifications and things that you're not going to see in a normal Super Mario world and Taskbot is going to just do all kinds of insanity. This is really, really cool to see. So right off the bat here you'll notice that this is not at all uh, your, your grandpa's Mario world. This is completely different. Uh, there's going to be a lot of manipulation here and a lot of unintended strats. Uh, he's using less bullets here than you normally would and that shell is actually supposed to go down below you but you can just do a shell jump there. Those uh, left-right screen scrolls are to set up the baseballs and he's going to actually bring the shell with him uh, because we want to duplicate that block and overwrite another block. We're going to get a shell and now bring Yoshi. Now watch very carefully because Yoshi is supposed to be ditched right there. The player shouldn't have Yoshi anymore at all. And oh, oh, geez, would you? Oh, okay, we're fine. Oh, yeah, I think we're okay. Okay, okay. yeah, and we got the <laughs> invisible Yoshi. So keep in mind that after this level, the player should not have Yoshi at all. They were supposed to ditch him way back. Way back when, don't worry, he's invisible, he's fine, he'll, he'll be okay. So one thing that's really important about Yoshi is that Yoshi's boots, magic boots, this seem to be a theme today, has been super powerful. He can stand on just about anything, and so you're going to see um, a lot of Yoshi being able to walk across a lot of surfaces that Mario can't touch. That bullet through the pipe is just for swag. Uh, so right off the bat here, Yoshi's going to be jumping on some of these munchers. Uh, he's impervious to them, doesn't die. And uh, this is actually kind of the RTA strat for this game. Uh, this game actually is RTA viable, uh, and a number of players have beaten it. Uh, the spin jump through the floor there <laughs> is pretty swag. And Yoshi ate the shell as he was jumping on it. You're going to see that trick used a lot. Uh, when the shell is kind of in that poof animation, Yoshi can just eat it again and create a copy. And bringing it through the pipe there, he got a naked Koopa, and now he has a rainbow shell in his mouth and can clip through the floor because Taz does things. So you're saying when you beat this, you didn't do it this way? No, you actually have to play these obstacles, RTA. Uh, this game has actually been uh, is really difficult to beat and is, is notoriously uh, famous for players that have been able to complete it. Uh, notably, Kalko, the world record holder, Dode, who has been on GDQ stages before, uh, myself, I've beaten this RTA, and Grand Pooh Bear and Barbarian, just to name a couple of the, uh, the players that have taken this on. But we're going to be getting into level three now, and uh, this, is, this is kind of an interesting thing, and it's a chance for us to talk about the way layers work in this game. So you see that the screen is scrolling around, but the munchers on the bottom actually stay stationary, and that's because they're on a different layer. Uh, everything else in this level, except for the munchers, is on layer one, and these munchers are on layer two, and that allows the screen to move around it while the munchers stay stationary. Oh, how did that work? Well, <laughs> it was actually because Yoshi took damage uh, when he was eating something, and now He's created just a harmless uh, enemy because it just kind of falls off your tongue while you're trying to eat it. This is an auto-scroller, so uh, Taskbot is just killing some time here. By repeatedly veiling off Yoshi like that, uh, he can charge up the combo counter, and that's how he got a one-up on that bullet, uh, which is, I just think it's a really cool trick. And uh, you'll notice that also Taskbot doesn't really care about walls or how they're supposed to work. Uh, you don't really want to eat that mole, but Taskbot, oh, hey, okay. <laughs> we can just do this now. He's sliding uphill, isn't he? Yeah, you can actually do that uh, RTA, but replacing Yoshi's head with the fireball is a little bit more difficult. <laughs> and it glitched the sprites, totally. So the, the mole should still be on, oh, there he is. He should still be on screen. But uh, it doesn't really matter. If you were doing this RTA, you would actually be riding on the, the mole's head the entire time. Uh, because, but because we have Yoshi where we're not supposed to, uh, it makes this the whole thread of the munchers I don't think that's meaningless. Oh, what, what happened to his head there? <laughs> that Ooh. is because there should be a baby Yoshi on screen. Uh, and if there's a baby Yoshi and a real Yoshi on screen, the baby Yoshi will overrate Yoshi's head. So normally you see Mario kind of bouncing on this disco shell. This section, you're actually supposed to do that the entire time. Uh, you're, you're surfing on this disco shell, and uh, Yoshi, doesn't, Yoshi doesn't care about that. He doesn't care about munchers, and uh, he can, he's impervious to the saws and to the black munchers that are on the bottom here. But normally you would be surfing this entire time. Uh, so Yoshi don't care? Never. Honey badger? Maybe okay. a bit. So there's a, there's a Lakitu above there, and um, he's throwing some spinies down. Oh, there he is. Look at that. Wasn't That looked like a Lakitu, right? It looked uh, like a Cappy hat. <laughs> he's actually just in the wrong sprite set. Uh, he would look like that even if he were on screen. So you see a couple more of these tricks. Um, poofing the shell, jumping on it with Yoshi in that sort of poof animation. Yoshi can eat that animation, and it just creates another copy of the same item. And you're going to see that used a few more times with P-switches and with a lot of shells. That no P-speed midair is a really impressive trick. Uh, it's very, very, very hard to pull off RTA. Again, Taskbot just kind of having some fun here with this. Uh, but Oh, hey, a <laughs> that was pretty neat. Uh, so he's manipulating the stun timer uh, for that yellow Koopa when it pops out, and you can load other sprites in and create 
uh, sprites out of thin air. And normally this would be a super hard gauntlet where you're surfing on a disco shell and there's all these saws that are falling at you, but Yoshi's despawning a lot of them and eating them because magic. And it uh, looks like we're going to try to get the goalpost to spawn early. There it is. So he cleared the level just without even touching it because the sprite is the goal, the moving tape at the end of the goal is a sprite that you can respawn in. That's not how you're supposed to play that level. No. How, what was your, uh, what's the typical time for a human to complete this whole game? Oh, uh, geez, anywhere between 20 and 70 hours, maybe. Uh, but so you're not allowed to take Yoshi into the ghost house. That's just a property of vanilla Super Mario World. Uh, he's getting some P-speed here so he can damage boost through those ghosts. And those smashing platforms are also on there, too. So you're going to see a little bit of camera scrolling to manipulate the positions of those falling platforms. The double fishing boos are fun, but you can just wall jump and get right around them. And now this fight doesn't, this is not how you're supposed to do this at all whatsoever. So you're supposed to stay down there at the bottom, but because Taskbot can do wall jumps whenever he wants, he can actually just go up to the top here. The way you're supposed to do this is by hanging out at the bottom on those uh, purple grab blocks and throwing them up individually to hit this big boo when he's uh, vulnerable. Uh, but Taskbot has brought one block up with him and has a shell and is just going to be able to register three hits and clear no problem. <laughs> that is way faster than I think anybody could do. And it, it's worth noting that the spikes would have killed him. Uh, he's like one pixel away from the spikes. That was just for swag at the end there. You know, one pixel from death explains almost every task. Yeah. Oh no! Oh, no, Taskbot! No, Taskbot! You don't want to. Yeah, you don't want to save. Don't worry about it, man. Th this this does not look good, guys. Oh, he's gonna be. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, I, no, this doesn't look good. I don't think he's supposed to do that. I, uh, that, my friends, is called a desync. Taskbot, you okay, man? It's okay. Don't it's okay. don't worry. You have stage you're fright. Fine. Yep. It's all right. No, he's yeah. It would it would appear that we're desynced yeah. at this yeah, time. Yeah, we are absolutely positively desynced. Yeah. Um, which is well, that was cool. Look at that little dance. That was fun. Yeah. Mm hmm. Okay, so let me explain what just happened as we reset. So first of all, uh, that rarely happens. We did this how many times in the practice room? Over and over and over again. Several, several many. Uh, serial exception, device reports readiness to read but return no data, device disconnected or multiple access port. I believe that while we were doing this, I accidentally unplugged this cable somehow with my leg. Uh, can you please get the other USB mini cable that's in that bag over there, please? <laughs> It's okay. worth noting that Twango's actually got this running on a real console, which is really, really impressive. In my yeah, opinion. this is full console verification. So um, I, I brought a couple of USB cables. USB mini cables are widely known for being kind of a pain in the butt. So there is another cable inside of my bag. It's inside of a toolbox bag. Um, so sorry for the delay. We will be right back with you. Uh, so actually, I see them looking right now. I brought. T I always bring two of everything. I brought two laptops. This is this is one laptop. I got another laptop. Y you got to do it. All right. Did you find it? You found it. And wow, is that short? Okay. So uh, we're gonna put Taskbot on a short leash, and uh, <laughs> here goes. Oh no, that guys, that's a mini. I need the. I need a. I, this is the microwave. I need the mini. It should be in there. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Hey, it's a slightly less short leash. Okay, all right, right cable. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, this is one of those cases where you just can't always predict for everything that happened. In this case, I literally unplugged the cable with my leg. So the very first thing we need to do is what's called a Dell save. Uh, because we've already run through the game, uh, what I have to do is delete the contents of the save file you, hear, you see here. So we'll do that right away. I don't mind mercy killing Hyper Princess Pitch. I mean, I didn't want to do it, but this one we can't. We can't mercy kill this. This is just too insane to just give up on the first try. All right, here goes, and start that timer again. Oh wait, 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 wait. TTY USB two, because I replaced the device, and now we'll be able to go. All right, now I'll set the timer. Okay, so we're going. <laughs> So that's, I mean, that's cool. You probably missed a couple of things uh, before. And it also gives us a chance to talk a little bit about um, Super Mario World ROM hacking in general, which has really uh, been popular. And you guys have seen um, uh, Grand Pooh Bear doing Dram Runs and uh, Dodecahedron doing, um, what did he run? Panga World. Uh, so you've seen some ROM hacks at GDQ before. And uh, this is one of the most infamous. Uh, this this hack has a, really, uh, a reputation for a really extreme skill. 
And uh, there's a lot of uh, players that have beaten this by now, but it takes a Herculean effort from just about anybody. So I'm going to try to point out a couple of things uh, that you might have missed the first time, but I think we got most of it. Um, again, the bullets here, you need a few more bullets uh, than Taskbot is using. So the, that shell, see that yellow rotating block? That's where that shell is supposed to go, but he just did sort of a shell jump off the wall there to get it through. One other thing I'd like to point out really quick. This visualization board you see up here on this top display, you can see some cases here where the buttons are being pressed a little bit more insanely than a normal human being would be able to do. Uh, especially when we get into later swimming levels, you'll see that it presses left and right with 60 hertz frame, per frame perfect accuracy. Left and then right and then left and then right 60 times in one second. So th you're going to see a lot of nutty uh, input if you watch this visualization board as we continue through. Yeah. Imagine a human trying to do that with their fingers. <laughs> but the crazy thing is there's nothing that we're doing here that's technically illegal. I don't even think we use left and right at any point, do we? Wait, left left and right simultaneously? Yeah, do we? I think that's in the other one, not the Yeah, other. I don't think it, this one even Maybe in that. the water level a little bit, but that's that's more just clipping. So you can do this this wall clip. If you're playing regular Mario World and you want to try that trick, you actually can try that RTA. You can just use big Mario and scoot into a space that only small Mario can fit in, and if you just try to spin jump while you're in that, it will send you through the floor. Uh, that's a pretty common trick that you see in, in a lot of RTA runs. You can actually try that one at home uh, if you want. Not, not in this context, obviously. <laughs> so how did he end up outside of the, the area you should be in? How did he get, end up out of bounds there? I, was a, I think it was just a clip through the floor. Yoshi can kind of go through corners. Corners in this game are a little bit odd um, in the way they detect your positioning, so he can just manipulate that because frame-perfect inputs. Because frame-perfect inputs. Reliable frame-perfect inputs, too. So we're coming up back on the bridge. You get to see all this TAS swag again. Now, collision detection in, in this particular segment, if you got near that mole too close, he would he would kill you, right? Yeah, so he would damage you. He, that, that was as close as you could probably get without glitching into him, right? Maybe we'd have to check the pixels. Um, but yeah, by eating, so he ate the mole and then took damage and lost Yoshi while Yoshi had the mole on his tongue. And that's what allows this harmless enemy to be created. You can do this also um, in vanilla regular Mario World uh, RTA in the one Star Road level, if you feed a Yoshi, uh, if you feed a baby Yoshi and it grows up exactly as it's trying to eat another enemy, uh, it will produce just a harmless version of the enemy that will just walk around without damaging you at all. And how did he get that one up just there? The one up was, um, so when you bail off Yoshi, if you're, if you're riding Yoshi and you spin jump to leave Yoshi's back and then you immediately spin jump again once you land back on Yoshi, that for some reason charges your bonus counter. So you, uh, you know like when Mario jumps on rows of enemies in a row, you get like 100 points, 200 points, 400, 800, and so on all the way up to one-ups. You can actually just manually charge that counter by jumping on and off Yoshi like that. Uh, it's more of a high score trick than anything else, but um, you can use it to get a free one-up off of things because you can charge your counter up to one-ups and that just, just have infinite one-ups. You can do that RTA, too. There's lots of things that you can actually take these tricks and play them in real Super Mario World, and that's what's really cool about a lot of these um, modified games is that um, they contain things that are possible in the real original Mario World, just recontextualized to show off just how difficult and uh, interesting a lot of the tricks can be. On the same token in slightly slightly different direction, a lot of times, tricks and glitches found with tool-assisted speedrun techniques are used by real-time runners. Yeah, that can happen. <laughs> shout out to the Dode who manages to translate all kinds of task things into RTA. So all rainbow shells fly. That's not a uh, that's not a glitch or anything. That's just a vanilla property. I, I never get tired of seeing that Lakitu die. <laughs> it, it really does look like Cappy. I don't know, just to me. I don't know. Like, the corrupt sprites are never it, were supposed to be on these screens at all. Yeah, that's usually because um, each individual level in Super Mario World has sort of a, a set bank of sprites that it knows what they are and knows how to call them. And if you try to add a sprite uh, which is not part of the level's kind of hard-coded sprite set, uh, it will behave normally, but it will have corrupted graphics, which is super interesting. So um, you need to make... Well, this level kind of has some custom sprite sets, too. You can customize your, your banks of sprites, but um, I guess for some reason Takamoto didn't feel the need to do anything with that Lakitu, probably because it was presumed that it would always be off-screen. So yeah, here's this stun timer manipulation we were talking about. The Koopas take a little bit to respawn uh, and jump in and out of their shells, and I think we're going to be swapping in the goalpost sprite uh, pretty soon, right about now when Yoshi eats that coin. There it is. 
So he got the goal post. Instead, he ate the goal sprite because the tape that moves up and down is a sprite and can be manipulated to clear the level faster. And don't worry, it'll keep going. We won't desync this time. You gotta leave Yoshi outside. He's not allowed in the ghost. Poor, He's, too poor Yoshi. Scared. He's too scared. Yeah, he I would be scared of being in here. This this always scared me <laughs> as a kid. <laughs> this game is pretty pretty scary and intense. Um, that's you're supposed to go to the right there to bring that block, boo buddy, so you can make that jump. But Taskbot can just get right up there. And again, that camera scroll is to manipulate the smash platforms that you see kind of rising up and down. Also, those enemies are mean and evil and terrible. Fishing boo, do ev everybody everybody loves fishing boo. You either love him or you hate him. He tracks your movement. And as he, you, know, you move left, he moves left, and uh, can really turn around and juke you in just the worst way sometimes. But keep in mind, like I said, even though Taskbot is doing this in a, in a really crazy fast way, this game actually is RTA viable and can be speedrun uh, by... Mere mortals? Yes, <laughs> I guess. Maybe they're mortals. <laughs> Are you mortal? I hope so, personally. I hope so. That looks better. Okay, I think we're okay now. Yeah, we're okay. Well, I yeah, I know yeah. last time the cable literally just got unplugged somehow. Yeah. Okay. So we're good. So this is the this is the water level. Actually, water levels can be pretty annoying, but I actually personally like this level. I think it's kind of fun. Um, so you've got again, you've got the layer two. Those sandbars, those yellow sandbars, are on layer two. So they're on a separate layer from the green walls that you see. And uh, Taskboard is setting up for a trick here, which I think a lot of 96 X8 runners will be familiar with in the vanilla game, uh, where Yoshi he's going to remount and dismount Yoshi in order to get his position right and just clip through the floor. And you actually can see that trick in, uh, what's that? Force of Illusion 2 in the water level, that trick gets used in the vanilla runs. And you wonder why Taskbot has to hesitate just a little bit there. It's because the yellow sandbars still exist, even when they're below um, the green floor. And so he has to wait for the sandbars to move away uh, because he's only clipped through layer 1, and layer 2 is still exists even if you can't see it. This section is great, but Taskbot just completely ignores it, and the pipe is on layer 2 uh, to trick you. You gotta wait for it. Unfortunately, it just is not in the right. Oh man, he lost Yoshi. Oh, Yoshi's fine. I love him. Okay, we gotta we gotta keep Yoshi alive. We gotta kill him later. <laughs> That's harsh, man. Spoiler alert. I think, I think everyone saw that coming, though, right? Yeah, well... There's the clip. So, okay, so by taking damage and getting pushed by that sandbar, he can just get sent right into the wall. And setting up a little bit, he wants to yeah, avoid that mushroom and eat that shell so he can clip up into the ceiling up there. So this last part coming up is supposed to be a maze. You're supposed to swim through it and do the right timings and find the right way. Taskbot doesn't care at all. No. It's pretty easy to clip through uh, some of those cement blocks if you have really precise movements. Uh, normally, real-time players don't do it that way. So this level is actually my very favorite level in this whole game. It's called Sky Tree. And uh, you're, what you're supposed to do is hit this uh, yellow block to create a vine. And you're keeping that vine alive the entire time and climbing. But that's really slow. So Taskbot has a better idea here. First, he's going to get that grab block and use it to duplicate a bunch of blocks so that Yoshi can be sent through the floor like that, because that was the only way to get Yoshi. And now he doesn't even need the vine to grow. Uh, he's just going to continue through this level. Normally, you're getting things out of the way of the vine and making space for it so it can grow and you can keep climbing it. That was just to kill some time and clip again through the floor, just get pushed up like that. And this is why we have Yoshi. There he is. He's gone. So uh. anticlimactic, right? You know, he might not even be dead. I might have misspoke. He actually is probably just safe and sound down there, just living his life. Again, that yellow block right there is supposed to be a vine, but who cares? And also you see if when the, the camera is kind of having trouble following Mario here, that's because the camera only scrolls up in vertical levels like this when you're standing. And so uh, every time the camera doesn't follow a taskbot, it's a frame-perfect jump that he's doing. A couple of double blocks to get up there. Uh, one thing that you it was went by really quick, I don't know if you noticed, but when you duplicate blocks, you can overwrite blocks in adjacent squares. And you're going to see that used a little bit more in the next thing. Uh, but what he did right there was duplicated a couple rotating blocks into the cement blocks, turned the cement blocks into rotating blocks so that they could then rotate and be a free space for him to stand in and get a jump. All right, so coming up, this is the um, not the end of the game, even though it is the, uh, the Koopa Fortress. It's Koopa Keep Kyoto. And this level is the bane of so many players' existence. These dolphins are RNG. And again, we've got the Lair 2 smash coming down uh, with the little 
Dorito spikes there. These strats are kind of how you would do it RTA for the most part, except for Taskbot has perfect control and perfect understanding of the Dolphin RNG. Uh, he's making this look so easy right now. So check it out right here. Um, because he knows what Dolphins are coming up, uh, he d can skip hiding in the rest of those safe spots and just clear that. Normally you're supposed to wait two or three more cycles for that. Oh, geez, it's Bowser. Watch out. Oh, he's fine. Don't worry. He's dead. It's okay. And some headbang in there. That was, that was, I like that on the task. So this is a modified version of the Wendy fight from Vanilla SMW. And as you can see, we are killing Peach. Uh, it's been, uh, thwomps have been added to this fight and uh, the fireballs, but the general structure of the fight is preserved. The two dummies and the one real enemy that you can hit. And um, that's usually um, Wendy's, Lemmy, and Reznor's, and Big Boo get used a lot in uh, Super Mario World ROM hacks because they're easier to modify than some of the other enemies. Like, um, like Larry or Roy, for example. So one thing I want to comment on while this is going through, the reason that we could get those dolphins to behave the way they did is because if we keep pressing the exact same sequence of button presses, the randomness is always exactly the same, so we force the RNG sequence to be the same. And you might want to explain this Japanese text real quick. Oh, well, it's, it's very deep. It says that Mario killed Peach but felt nothing, so he continues on wandering lost in the world. That's dark, man. Takamoto is a kind of a dark maker. He's really mysterious. He released three of these Kaizo games, Kaizo 1, 2, and 3, and pretty much coined the term Kaizo, which is actually Japanese for rearrange, uh, but Kaizo has become a colloquial term for super hard Mario. That's not a trick. That's actually just a door that's there. Uh, this level is a big maze, and even RTA runs cheese this a little bit because the solution is very long. You notice that you have FF6 time. Uh, that's just like some hexadecimal overflow. But Taskbot is going to do this in a really cool way. So Yoshi grows up while he's in the floor or while in the ceiling up there, and that allows you to mount Yoshi inside the ceiling and just clip through everything. And since the P-switch is active, they can just run and get right into the pipe. That is uh, way faster than RTA strats. And they get extra points for having FE0 time. <laughs> Takes a while to get all those extra points. It's still faster than the actual strat, though, and they, just, they didn't even add up all the rest of the points. No. They just, like, ditch it. Like, who cares? Uh, so normally, that level has a regular exit and a secret exit. If you get the secret exit, you go to a, a gauntlet of boss fights, and then you get to a place called the Break Room, which gives you mushrooms and a Yoshi. Uh, Takamon actually gave you some power-ups in this. And so RTA runners will actually be able to have uh, a Yoshi for some of these levels. Uh, this is kind of the way you would do this RTA. Uh, this is this is the oh no that's not the RTA strat that's just clipping but this you lose Yoshi and then run and catch up with him that's a little bit of how you would actually do this you're supposed to eat that pokey but your task can just clip right through and now he actually wants to get the checkpoint here not for the safety but for the big power up um, he's gonna do a couple more clips to get through the wall there and lose Yoshi and get the chuck to jump eat that blue shell now he can fly. And there is a fun cheese to do at the end of this uh, for RTA runs, but Taskbot has an even better idea. Just, hey, go through the ceiling, no problem. And he'll be able to fly uh, all the way to the exit. There were a couple more obstacles there. That's one, one of the things about these games is that it, so often you can just fly over the level. And what I like about this particular run is that you don't really have a lot of that. It's, there's a lot of variety in this one. Yeah, for sure. All right, what do we got next? Let me just save. Okay, yeah, we're coming up on, so so that level, uh, the one that Taskbot just played was called Heck, and this one is called Heaven, and this level is so difficult that even RTA players have don't typically actually beat this. You get a Yoshi from the Coliseum. In Taskbot's case, he just kept a Yoshi. You eat that same rainbow shell, and you're now able to fly. Um, so t normally, you could fly up and fly above the auto-scroll trigger, uh, but Taskbot's actually just going to go through the pipe and do some shenanigans here. <laughs> <laughs> in the, I love that. It's so great. He's mounting and remounting uh, Yoshi as he's there to just sort of hover in the air. So this is an auto scroll. So you're going to see uh, Taskbot just having some fun. I think he's gotten over his nerves from before. Uh, he's, he seems to be loosened up a little bit and having a lot more fun. There's the underpants platforms, the little up and down moving ones. Under Underpants? Yeah, platform? see, they look like underpants. I oh, man. So this is actually, uh, the player right now is in the machinery of this level. Um, to be honest with you, I don't even know the RTA way that you're supposed to do this, but it's just incredibly hard. And the gimmick of this level in real time is that you're hitting these on-off switches to change the dotted line, outline blocks into solid blocks, and vice versa, depending on your needs. And there's all kinds of incredible stuff that you have to do with this uh, in real time. But again, you can just get the Yoshi from the Coliseum RTA. And oh, that was fun, the frame perfect jump off the P-switch. Um, but yeah, you can normally just bring the Yoshi from the Coliseum here. Uh, I think this is. Is this the penguin trick? 
hard to keep track of all. Yeah, there's yeah. the trick from Panga World. So by doubling those note blocks right there, uh, the fact that so many note blocks are being doubled, it overwrites another block, and that's how he was able to get out uh, of that little trap. Otherwise, the floor would have been solid. So, okay, he's setting up for the end of this. He wants two P-switches, and now he ate a copy of it with Yoshi, got another P-switch, now he has two P-switches, and he's going to bring both of them through the pipe, frame-perfect jump off that one, and then take the silver P-switch across the goal to create a mushroom. And these mushrooms are going to come in handy in the final level. Uh, but the flower, you, can't, you can never get it. It's uh, just a tease at the end. So this is it. This is the final level. You guys are really going to like this. Um, this is, like, everybody's favorite. I think everyone just always has a great time with this final level. They, they really think it's just fair and balanced and easy and just, just a true joy to play. And so keep in mind, Taskbot has uh, a, a mushroom and another mushroom in the item reserve box, and that's going to be important later. Right now, um, he's just moving through this section, and the lava on the ceiling and on the floor is both on layer two, and it scrolls up and down, and its direction is reversed by hitting those on-off blocks. And you can get a little bit of the ways into the lava, about one block, but if you get any more than that, uh, you will die. That pause there was to get that statue to shoot two fireballs. You can manipulate those fireball sections by pausing, and then the no P-speed midair. So you're supposed to run to the right, but Taskbot, by doubling these on-off switches, can just clip through the wall and now we get into this iconic fight, which has tormented so many players. This is amazing. Everything here is RNG. Whether he shoots hammers is RNG. The position of the hammers, uh, whether he, where he moves, when he shoots fire or hammers, and bombs destroy him. This takes five hits, and the fight evolves as this goes on. Uh, Taskbot knows what's going on, so Taskbot isn't as scared as real players who could take uh, up to 20 or 30 or more hours to beat this fight one time. And uh, we're going to need to score five hits again. Now keep in mind, time is going to end early because for a task, uh, the time ends at the end of input. And that's what these two mushrooms are for. So you notice the magic coop is showing up. This fight gets even harder as it goes on. So we're on the fifth phase now. He needs one more hit on with the bomb to kill Bowser. And time is going to stop now. Now, yeah, we're actually. already done. Time. Yeah, so we're waiting for the bomb. Mario powers up with the mushroom because that was set up ahead of time. And there's Bowser dead, and that's the end of the game. That's Kaizo 3. Well, thank you so much for your commentary. And this, we are coming right back. If you thought this game had some craziness to it, strap yourselves in. Give us one quick break. We'll be right back with Item Abuse 3. And welcome back. This is even more insane. It's gonna, actually going to be hard for you to say everything you need to say as yeah, quickly it, as you need to say it. I cannot physically talk this fast and explain all these tricks. It often comes up, what is the hardest Super Mario World ROM hack of all time? And a really good case could be made for this. Item Abuse Absolutely. 3 by Pangea Panga. All right, uh, we're going to start this off. Three, two, one, go. Okay, first of all, I can assure you this is not possible for humans. You cannot do this. In fact, this was designed to be a challenge to task. So even with frame advance and all the tricks that uh, Taskbot uses, it still is a challenge to figure out how to put all these things together. You're going to see a lot of, well, item abuse. And that uh, refers to objects that Mario can hold and interact with. And because the relationship is kind of glitchy between the two of them, uh, it creates some weird things. So the first thing we're going to do is play with shells. And right about there is where a real player could probably get. It might be theoretically possible to beat that first level, but there's already so many frame perfect tricks in that already. And so keep in mind, uh, moving shells you can get a jump off of. Non-moving shells are inactive, and you can't get a jump off of them. And that's going to be really important later. But first, we get to play with this key. And we're actually going to skip a bit of this room. This is not even the intended way to task this room. But by being able to stand on the key, it works as a platform in the air. <laughs> it just sit back and enjoy. This is amazing. So we're setting up for a rope glitch right now. Uh, if Mario is holding a rope and gets pushed off of the rope, uh, it, the game will just continue to think that he's still on a rope and that is what's happening here because it looks like we're dead but no no problem we're just jumping through the air because that's normal and fun and cool to do uh, you don't necessarily see the rope grab uh, grab uh, animation but it happens so quickly but you're definitely that's wise because he's jumping uh, jumping off a rope because the game still thinks he's holding that this is one of my favorite situations okay so the baseballs kill you uh, the coins the directional coins up there are being controlled by inputs uh, you don't want the grab block and the disco shell that you're riding down there to collide because they will destroy each other. And he's going to set up a couple of things to these uh, dotted outline blocks are invisible Kaizo blocks. And he's overwritten some of them with regular invisible blocks that you can stand on so you can pass by. <laughs> no problem. 
You can so, see why you can't get here as a human. <laughs> this, this is, like, I assure you, this is physically impossible for humans to do. Also, take a look at the inputs and you'll see. So the cape is one of the most broken things in this game. First of all, when you, uh, you can hold an object and fly backwards like that. Uh, if you have your cape puffed out and you touch something, you just get iframes. You don't actually lose your cape. And I think he's just going to, yeah, just goodbye, baby Yoshi. See you later. Yeah, this is not even the intended method. So now we're going to do something really cool. He's going to get in there and going to double boxes. And now he's generated uh, extra Yoshis. So keep in mind, he's riding two Yoshis right now, and we're going to use that shell poofing trick again. So he's eating the poof animation from the shell. He's got one Yoshi, but he's riding another one. So when you ditch the first one, the second one appears. <laughs> so this is my favorite section. This is, this is poetry. I, I, this is how I wish I could play in my dreams. We're going to be using shells uh, all over here. So the first thing you're going to notice is a lot of the left-right movement with the shells. Um, that is abusing the fact that when you're holding a shell in one direction and you turn left or right, uh, there's a brief moment where the shell's hitbox overlaps with Mario's hitbox. And if you throw the shell at that time while the hitbox is overlapping, the shell becomes active, so it's moving, so you get a jump off of it. Now keep an eye on that yellow shell to the uh, right there. We're going to need that later, so we kind of got to kill a little bit of time to make sure that shell stays with us on the screen and doesn't despawn. All these jumps off the P-switch, they're all, we call it a yump. Uh, and it is a frame perfect uh, trick. The contact pressing jump, the first frame that you contact, uh, the top of the P switch. That yellow shell gets left behind, but don't worry, there's more shells. And these double carries uh, with shells you see coming up here. A couple of drops and another sort of non P speed midair right there. Don't worry, the yellow shell is still here. Taskbot just has to do a little wall clip uh, jump to keep it up. Now, so the shell is just sort of going left and right like this. That's actually left-right inputs, uh, like I said, abusing the fact that the, during that left-right, the shell's hitbox and Mario's hitbox overlaps. It's just it's so fast that it's hard to see um, the actual left-right turn. And that's what we need the yellow shell for. Brought it all the way from the top. Nope. So now we're going to do a little bit of swimming. Uh, these double item carries uh, underwater are a task trick, and uh, pretty much everything in this section kills you. Wa water levels are horrible. He wants to wait for that charging chuck to jump out of that little crevice there. It sort of hops toward you, and the P-switch to open that gap, and now everything dies. Off to the right. <laughs> the shell's going to open up those rotating blocks by hitting them, and he's going to need to kick that shell in so he can get inside that channel. Swimming through that gap uh, is not humanly possible. And just clip right through that corner and get in the door, no problem for Taskbot. So we're going to see a lot of block duplication in this section. Uh, by, like I said, by hitting a block with a shell, you're tricking the game into thinking that you're hitting that same block, but in an adjacent spot. And keep in mind that that can overwrite blocks. All these outlined blue blocks that you see, those are Kaizos. They would be an invisible coin block. Uh, they turn into coins when the P-switch is active, because they would be a brown block, which would turn into a coin. So you're going to see uh, Taskbot, especially right here. Notice on the right, it's blocked off by those skull death blocks. He cannot get through. So what Taskbot's going to do is duplicate these rotating blocks and overwrite the death blocks so he can jump through. Now the frame perfect jump again off the P switch and the brown blocks turning into coins. Just a couple of meters. I think those were just for fun. I think Taskbot's just showing off at this point. And this is just some regular task trickery to get through. Uh, there's really not even a lot of, eh, just pretty, pretty standard, honestly, if you can even say that about a task. Duplicating these note blocks again. He needs that little nutch in there to jump and stand, get a, get a jump. Oh, hey, it's Yoshi. I bet we'll take him with us this time, surely. He's a good buddy. Uh, if you're bouncing off Yoshi, Yoshi won't sink in the lava uh, if you're not standing on him. Hey, he just, just left him there. Did, did he sink in the lava anyway? No, he'll just stand there forever on the lava. Okay. So this is pretty cool. Notice, um, all these shells will hit the Big Boo. So the Taskbot is being really careful to not... Uh, overlap Big Boo while he's active with a shell because that will register a hit. He wants to nudge that yellow shell up there off the platform and get it. Meanwhile, he's using two shells to juggle and stay alive in this section because he will die. So there's the first hit on Big Boo. Now he's got a clip and now he's into a spin jump and you can spin jump on those eeries. Uh, keep in mind again, task inputs or task time ends at the end of inputs. So we're going to end inputs a little bit early here. He set that shell up on the right side and that's going to kill time. time and wait for the Big Boo kill. Dead. Yeah, there you go. And that is it. That is item abuse three. And who did the tool assisted speed run? Who was the author of this? Was that I who was Oh, who was the author of this? That was I cannot pronounce his name. X X X H F Zero One X. And this level Very was, great work. And this level was made by Pangea Panga. Which is amazing. The one and only. If you watched this video on some later recording and you don't have the context of some of the tricks that were done, watch the Kaizo Mario World 3 that we just did. I'd like to, on behalf of the entire Taskbot community and the entire Task Videos community say thank you for watching. You can find more information about tool assisted speedruns at taskvideos.org. You can find more information about Taskbot at taskbot.net as well as our Discord server at discord.taskbot.net. 
course, Dwango AC on Twitch and all the other various sites like YouTube. You know, I know I'm supposed to say that at TwitchCon, but uh, I'd like to say thank you specifically to the crew that was here on site with me, which includes GlitchCat, Cheese05, we have TyKevin83, Stump, a few other folks that swung by. Thank you to everyone that makes this possible. This concludes the task block for GDQ 2018. Thank you.